Welcome to I'm Always on the Go, the painter Franz Domscheid, Rana Domscheidis in our series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. We tell untold stories of artists marginalized and persecuted by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. Today, I'm honored to introduce Jan Röttinger, who is the Deputy Museum Director and Curator of Art at the East Prussian State Museum in Lüneburg, Germany. He studied in Erlangen, Rom, and Bamberg. Degree, he has a degree in medieval art history, medieval history and archaeology of the Middle Ages and modern times in Bamberg. Visited graduate school, monastery and world at the University of Paderborn. Collaboration on the large medieval exhibition Canossa 1077, Erschütterung der Welt, Shaking of the World. Museum traineeship at the German Historical Museum Berlin. Afterwards, he was project co coordinator of a German-Polish-EU project in Kamenz, Upper Lusatia, and at the same time, research assistant and responsible for the St. Annan Museum of Sacred Art. He then became collection manager at the Museum of Bread and Art in Ulm, and then at the Diocesan Museum in Augsburg. He holds his current position since the end of 2022. After the presentation, there will be time for Q&A, so please pose your questions. Welcome, Jan Röttinger. Thank you very much for the introducing, Ms. Stern. And thank you very much that you was inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and to introduce this special artists. Last year, we had a big exhibition about him here in Lüneburg behind me, you see the poster for that. And this exhibition was in cooperation with the Planner Stoschitis Gallery in, in Kleipeda. And for this, I have to thank our partners in Lithuania. They provided us most with most of the pictures we showed in the exhibition. In general, we have a very good cooperation with them. For example, now, uh, they uh, have an exhibition about the expressionist Karl Eulenstein, and um, we provided the Pranus dem Scheites Gallery with a large number of paintings for this exhibition. But now, back to our topic, to our painter, Franz Domscheid, Pranus dem Scheites. I'm always on the go were the last words of the artist Franz Domscheid. They stand for life and work characterized by the search and pursuit of perfect expression in form color. He took elements from uh, various styles, including impressionism, expressionism, new objectivity and cubism, and incorporated them into his work. He was influenced by artists such as Ludwig Deppmann, Lovis Korint, Evert Munk, and Emil Nolde. At first, he found his motives in the simple landscape of East Prussia and uh, Lithuania and its inhabitants, as well as in the biblical stories of the New Testament. Later, still lives and portraits were added to his repertoire. His Numerous travels provided him with new motives and perspectives. The term uh, folk arts, which is a simple use of color form, uh, continued to influence his works throughout his life. And uh, his interest in Lithuanian textile, carving, and decorative arts is reflected in his paintings. At least in South Africa, Planners and scientists experimented with forms and styles, but uh, remained true to his dark, mostly earthly canon of colors, physical representation, and pictorial motifs of his homeland. 
Today, I would like to give an overview of the long career of this German, Lithuanian, South African artists. It should, note it, it should be noted at uh, the outset that uh, most of uh, Domscheid's works are undated. So for the content on chronology, I based my lecture on the fundamental art historical work on Franz Domscheid from 2015 by Christina Jokubavicene, the greatest expert on the artists. Franz Karl Wilhelm Domscheid was born in 1880 in the small Semlin village of Kropiens, 25 kilometers northeast of Königsberg, the eldest son of the farmer and innkeeper Karl Ludwig Domscheid and his wife, Mathilda Amanda. His parents were hardworking, good fearing, God fearing people and respected members of uh, the village community. His father saw Franz as the heir to the family farm and tried to raise him accordingly. Despite his mother's Lithuanian heritage, only German was spoken in the Domscheid household at his father's request. His mother's uh, Lithuanian was rarely used. She was able to teach her children only a few words, something Fritz Domscheid regretted all his life. He said, my knowledge of Lithuanian is poor. I didn't have enough time. And the Lithuanian language is particularly difficult to learn. But Lithuanian blood doesn't lie, just as my paintings are truly Lithuanian. Pranastum Shaitis, 1948. So also the deep religiosity of his mother was a long life, live, lifelong influence on Franz Domscheid. He was a he was a quiet and sensitive child who was encouraged in his early creativity by his mother. She also supported his artistic endeavors. Unlike his father, it must have been difficult for him growing up on his parents' farm. The Domscheid farm was located in the center of the village of Kropiens. There was a gas station in front of the house and a large and the large residential building housed a guest house and a post office. Every summer, a traveling circus, sometimes with gypsies and train and beers set up on the meadow next to the house. Further away was a red brick barn for the cattle. And there was also a wooden barn with a paddock and a pond behind it. Ferranz's tendency to observe, to took deeper from a very young age seemed strange to many. To draw with a piece of charcoal or a pencil on whatever was at hand, showing everything around him, his family, the animals, the neighbors. He did not have much to do with other village children of his age who could not understand his dreamy nature. Franz was quite a relaxed child who did not want to get in the way of anyone. But he liked to learn, found many things interesting and read a lot. At the age of 12, he heard about the Cape of Good Hope in school and even saw a picture. A great desire arose to visit this place. Finally, at the end of his life, he was there. When he came of age after a long discussion, he was at least able to study to become an art teacher at the Königsberg Art Academy. A neighbor of the Domscheids had bought one of his early paintings and gave him good money for it. This also convinced his father to let Franz go 
to Königsberg. Studies at the drawing department of the Königsberg Art Academy lasted two years. So it is assumed that Domscheid studied there from 1902 to 1903. During this time, he was taught drawing by Karl Storch, the Elder, and Hermann Wirth. The earliest surviving drawings by Domscheid are from this period. You see here a portrait of his mother and his father. They show traditionally academic, academic drawing tasks. Perhaps it was there that he first came into contact with the impressionist style of painting, which the artist showed in his oil paintings of uh, 1905. Here you see, for, for example, also a picture of Karl Streich the Elder, which also had an influence, the style of uh, Karl Streich to uh, Franz Domscheid. After completing his studies, he worked for a year as a drawing teacher at a German gymnasium, a school like an high school. But his plans went much further. In 1905, he applied to study painting at the Königsberg Art Academy, but he was rejected for lack of talent. And his father wanted him back on the farm to follow his path as the eldest son. There are several versions what happened next. The fact is that Throughout his life, Franz Domscheid kept a short letter from Max Liebermann to the artist's father, dated on July 7, 1906. Dear Mr. Karl Domscheid, I have seen the work of your son Franz, and I'm sure that he will be able to do well in the art of painting, but it would be necessary that he be in a position to study without regard to earning money for one or two years. Most likely, Franz had previously brought several paintings to Berlin, among them a landscape of early spring encropions with two scopes by a pond similar uh, like these two, and showed them to Max Liebermann and initiated this letter. Thus, in the fall of 1907, Domscheid was accepted into the Königberg Art Academy where he even received a small scholarship. The Königsberg Art Academy of Art was founded in 1845 as a pure painting academy, so it's not surprising that the initial focus of the education was primarily on history painting. However, this focus shifted to landscape painting, and this may have been due to the wild nature and vast East Prussian landscape. The reasons, the reasons for this were the easier access and greater compatibility with history painting. After a period of uh, relative artistic stagnation, it was up to Ludwig Detman, who had been appointed director in 1901, to adapt the academy and its teaching to contemporary artistic demands. Influenced by Max Liebermann, he turned to landscape painting and was one of the founding members of the Berlin Secession in 1889. He recruited the right faculty for reform of the academy, including Olof Jernberg of Düsseldorf, Heinrich Wolf from Munich and Karl Storch, the elder from Berlin, which we just have seen, thus introducing impressionism to the curriculum. So Domscheid studied painting under Detmund. He teaches painting with its materiality, intense coloring, curls, brush stroke, virtual light reflexes, and simple rural motifs shaped it Domscheid's style. The appearance and pose of the young lady in Domscheid's painting Friesisches Mädchen, 
freezing girl is very similar to Detman's model, a slender girl with a scantish profile. Domscheid had several friends at the academy among them, and most importantly, Arthur Degner from Gumbinnen in East Prussia. Degner studied at the R Academy in Königsberg between 1906 and 1908 or 9. So he had uh, really been there a year when Domscheid arrived. So he had the new artist to integrate into the cosmos of the Art Academy. In addition, he and Domscheid had already begun to meet during their studies with the older artists Waldemar Rösler and Theo von Brockhusen in the small village of Klein Kuhn in, in Samland to paint the beautiful landscape with the Baltic Sea. Domscheid is also to be found in the artist's colony of Nidden. It may have been there too busy for, uh, the, uh, for him, which is probably why he preferred to visit the smaller Klein Kuhn. Nevertheless, he knew almost all the artists working in Nida. During his last year in Königsberg, he also met Fritz Ascher, whom he probably helped in the same way that Degner helped him learn about the workings at the Art Academy. During his years as a student, Domscheid became a part of the cultural life in the East Prussian metropolis of Königsberg, which had at that time about um, 250 million, 215,000 inhabitants. On the one hand, he was able to uh, participate in exhibitions at the Academy or uh, the Artists Association Malkasten. He was also able to further his education in the city's many museums, in particular the East Prussian Museum of Local History, which opened 1909, gave him an insight into rural life in Little Lithuania and Prussian Lithuania. There he was able to study everyday objects as well as examples of the textile and folk art of the region to which Domscheid really felt to belong. After completing his studies at the Königsberg Art Academy, Domscheid wanted to continue his education. So he went to the vibrant metropolis of Berlin. Many artists had joined the Berlin Secession worked there, including uh, Max Liebermann, Lovis Korinth, Max Pechstein, Walter Leistikow, and for example, Max Pechstein. He continued his studies at the private painting school of Lovis Korinth, who was also from East Prussia and had studied at the Königsberg Art Academy. Domscheid was interested in the technique of painting, but he did not like Korinth's attitude or his concept of painting. With this in mind, he attended Corinth's painting school from 1910 to 1911, leaving before Corinth suffered a serious stroke at the end of 1911. Inspired by his teacher's impulsive way of painting, the dramatic treatment of subjects and religious themes, he participated in a group exhibition for the first time in 1911 showing one of his oil paintings entitled uh, Huts at the Lagoon, so an East Prussian motif, which uh, sadly we uh, cannot see because it not survived. His first extended departure from uh, Germany had a specific purpose. Domscheid spent the first half of 1912 in St. Petersburg in Russia, where he was commissioned to paint portraits of uh, General Staff Officer Vasily Bodiriev and his family. In the following years, Domscheid visited other European countries and their capitals, such as 
Paris, Florence, Amsterdam, and London. He studied the artworks in the museums and met contemporary artists. He may have been inspired to create uh, another painting by uh, Jean-Francois Millet's woman, um, um, the Gleaners, let's say, as in many works of his of this period, everything takes place in the foreground we see here. The background is uh, barely used in his paintings. The flatness, uh, simpl simplicity of the forms, the lack of color, and uh, the rapid application of paint with uh, quick brush strokes already shown the characteristics of Franz Domscheid's typical style. In 1913, the former students of the Königsberg Art Academy met again in Berlin, Franz Domscheid, Arthur Degner, and Franz Asche. The contact with the expressionist Degner seems to have marked a, a decisive step towards expressionism in the art of Domscheid and Fritz Asche. Perhaps Degner also had the idea of traveling to Norway and visit Evert Munch in Oslo. With his trip in 1940, accompanied by Asche, Domscheid finally took a step forward to expressionism. Domscheid had been a member now of the Berlin secession since 1911, but left it in 1913 to join the free session, the session. During this time, Domscheid has also participated in a large number of group exhibitions, mainly organized by the free secession, but also in separate graphic and watercolors exhibitions. 1917 was not an easy year for the artist. After the death of his father in 1908, his mother also died. She had always supported her eldest son was his anchor point in East Prussia and Lithuanian culture. She was also a favorite subject in Domscheid early years. So Domscheid artistic development was interrupted when he was called out for military service in that year. He served in the military in Tilsit, where, among other things, he had to give food to Russian prisoners for war. But he did not stop painting and drawings. A few works from this period have devised mostly portraits of Russian and German soldiers. His return from the army at the end of the war in 1918 led him to a radical change in Domscheid's art as a result of his experience during this time. The colors became earthier and general darker, the subjects more serious. For a brief period, he was interested in depicting refugees and marginalized groups, and Domscheid simplified and generalized forms giving them a streamlined massiveness. As you can see here in the two pictures. Fragmented figures emerge from the pictorial space. Light becomes an important element. Islands of light are scattered over the surface of the entire canvas. Their formal source is a sky with its brilliant cumulus clouds, a dark moon or a dimmed sun but the actual source is somewhere deeper. Bright spots, reflection, and glimmers create a mystical atmosphere. While, while, uh, while the early landscapes were still characterized by plain air painting, a different style of painting is evident here. Instead of fine brush stroke, larger areas of color appear in a darkened palette. The intention was not longer to depict the actual landscape but rather the emotional involvement with it. The simplification of form and the dark colors together with small bright islands of color results in a dramatic depiction. 
blues, greens, and browns are accompanied by yellows and reds. During this time, however, he also began to be depict religious motifs, which he would pursue throughout his complete life. Throughout his life, Domshad varied that a motive of their flight to Egypt in many different ways. Here we see two of them. And later at the end in South Africa, we see some Tamil. The evangelical religiosity he inherited from his mother and lent to narrow selection of motives from the New Testament pictorial canon. With few colors and simplified massive forms, very much in the spirit of Edmund Munch, he depicts the motive of the curse in a biblical context. Not the moon or the sun, but Mary with a child is a radiant center of the painting. After the war, Domscha did not directly return to Berlin, however, but first spent about a year in Upper Bavaria in Mittenwald, right on the Bavarian-Austrian border at the foot of the Alps. With Usher and Kompite, Domscheid or met him in southern Germany. A 1919 drawing of a woman with a child in Usher's sketchbook which otherwise depicts people in Bavarian costume and mountainous landscape testified to this period. The simplified form with little differentiation in shading are typical of Domscheid. Before his exile to South, Af South Africa, he often visited the Alps, which was one of his favorite subjects. The mountains made a lasting impression on Domscheid, who become who came, who came from a region with a relatively flat uh, landscape. After his return to Berlin 1919, Domscheid again participated in four group exhibitions. However, his first solo exhibition that year at the Galerie Ferdinand Möller in Berlin was significant. There he showed 34 of his paintings made between 1907 and 1919. Art critics gave him a very mixed uh, reception. Also an extended version of this show in Breslau at the same year received more favorable, favorable reviews. Karl uh, Scheffler, the great art critic of the 1920s and early 30s commented, he, Domscheid, does not paint what the eye sees, but what he dreams with, uh, of while looking what remains in his movingly vivid memories as a visual expression of his primary spiritual experiences. The new decade of 1920s began for the artist in an emotional way. In 1920, he officially became a citizen of the young Republic of Lithuania and received a Lithuanian passport. This was also an expression of his inner closeness to the culture originis of his beloved mother. In the 1930s, Domscheid even considered spending the rest of his life in Lithuania, but the political changes of those years dedicated otherwise. Nevertheless, he remained, in Lith um, he remained a Lithuanian at heart. However, he was probably very rarely there in person. He had an overly romantic view of Lithuania. The country impressed him with his quiet, natural beauty and serenity. In his new passport of 1920, he added the surname Domscheitis. Around this year, 
he also created a monogram of his signature combining the first letters of his name and surname. There. Which could be read either as a German or the Lithuanian form of his name. Here we see the D and F for France and the P for Pranas. In his paintings of the 1920s, marginalized groups or exotic motifs appear again and again. His interest in them may have stemmed from the German-Lithuanian contrast and his enthusiasm for Lithuanian folk art. Oops. Yeah. Some of his works from this period depicted uh, depict gypsies. His, this may also be a reminder of his home on the farm in Kropiens, where, as I just said, traveling circus made an annual stop and the gypsies practiced with their dancing bees in the meadow. Domscheid remains true in his style there, dark, earthly colors, curls, almost expressionless, expressionless figures acting in the foreground. It is one of the last paintings in this expressionist style. The influence of new objectivity on Domscheid's work is noticeable in the paintings that follow. Perhaps in response to a criticism of Domscheid's art by an art dealer, he recommended that Domscheid should work with bright colors as the dark and gloomy paintings were not to the public's taste. There my mistake on the... Expressionism, which uh, turned away from uh, the views of the imperial era, was also interested in the supposed originality that artists such as Max Pechstein or Emil Nolde tried to find in the cultures of Africa and Oceania. Ethnological museums and ethnological exhibitions in zoos were popular destinations for artists, with the often prejudiced gaze of colonial Europeans, the artifacts and people from these places were viewed and captured in images. The expressionist idea of freedom had there its limits. Domscheid also saw Africa through his European eyes. He found many of his early African models in this ethnological exhibi exhibitions at the Berlin Zoo. He was fascinated by the exotic eth ethnic views and to the end of his life, the African theme never let him. And these old paintings, we see a different way of painting than before. There's a thin, clear layer of paint, minimal deformation, a realistic treatment of forms, light colors, and subtle shading, which gave vibrance to the people's face and the surrounding nature. But the African theme also dominated his drawings at that time, which he captured in the large number of portraits of the, which I show you two examples. So in the mid of 1920s, Domscheid painted almost simultaneously in di uh, different ways. The pictorial motive of rural labor were familiar to Domscheid from his own experience on the parents' farm. The motive appears again and again in his work as details in his landscapes and the depictions of village life or in large format in the foreground. But 
in the mid of 1920s, Domscheit discovered, as I just said, the new objectivity, objectivity style of painting. Clear, bright colors, a realistic formal language, and subtle shading gave this painting's uh, vibrancy. The subject of the potato peeler had preoccupied just Domscheid since his early days as an artist. Nearly identical drawings from 1906 and 1907 attested to an earlier use of the motive, which probably depicts the artist's mother. The 1920s and early 30s were the most successful years of Domscheid's career. During this time, he participated in 41 group exhibitions and had five solo shows. The artist was positively mentioned and reviewed in a number of German art magazines. In 1925, the Prussian Minister of Science, Art and Education purchased a duration picture, a painting with the name of that, shown in the spring exhibition of the Prussian Academy of Arts for the sum of 3000 Reichsmark and gave it to the National Gallery in Berlin. Two years later, the ministry purchased another painting by Domscheid for the National Gallery. Museums in Lübeck, Stettin and Hamburg also purchased his works. But Domscheid was not only in Berlin, he was always on the move. He traveled a lot during these years to Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Constantinople, Switzerland, France, Italy, Corsica, and the North Africa with Tunisia. During this period, he mainly painted pastels to depict the daily life of the villages and their animals. It's interesting that he used pastels for the southern landscapes and watercolors for the landscapes of the northern Germany. Perhaps this was connected with Eminolde, through whom he came, became known. But Domscheid was not only in Berlin, he was, um, oops, ah, that was. These years were uh, very successful for Domscheid, not only artistically, as an artist, but also personally. Around 1924, Domscheid met the opera singer Adelheid Armholt, who was 22 years younger than him, and he married her uh, only four years later. And in that year, he followed, he accompanied her on numerous concerts through Europe, even as far as uh, Istanbul, and used these trips to study and to make context, context to enable him to um, exhibit locally. And as you see here, he painted many portraits of his wife, also in the new objectivity style. In the 1930s, Domscheid returned to simple and realistic landscape painting. In addition to the Alps, the East Prussian landscape and coast remained popular motifs, which the artist often visited with his wife. The Kurian fishermen, like as you see here, are a classic motif of the artist commonly in Nidder and in generally for the art of East Prussia. Franz Domscheid stayed there and in Kleinkuren several times in the 1910s, as I just said, but also later in the 1930s, he and his wife visited the East Prussian coast several times, especially Neuhäuse and the Wistler's um, Bit, where Domscheid had distant relatives. Stylistically situated between expressionism and new objectivity, his work shows Domscheid's broad view of the landscape, which does not shy away from empty areas. 
the large brown fields, extracellular layers, and the flat land in Domscheid's homeland. And Domscheid would later use this simple two dimensional composition also in South African paintings. By the early 1930s, Domscheid was a sought after artist who could make a reasonably secure living from his art. Nevertheless, he was a frugal man and used almost every canvas a second time by painting on the back. But Domscheid's art came under pressure after 1933 due to the art policies of the National Socialists. He now mainly painted scenes of rural life and peasant work, landscapes, landscapes of East Prussian coast, the Austra Austrian and German Alps, and still lives. Also, he was able to show his work in solo exhibition until 1936, some of his works were confiscated from public collections in 1937. The adoration of the National Gallery in Berlin was shown in the Degenerate Art Exhibitions of 1937. In 1938, however, he was banned from, work, from working. This means a major break in the artist's life and work and, and ultimately led to his, to his leaving Berlin in Germany in 1939. He never returned to East Prussia or Lithuania. This period weighed heavily to, on the artist and he was due not only geographically, but also emotionally. His destination was the Australian Alps. There he felt safe from reprisals and later from the events of war. He first went to Carinthia, where uh, he painted several views of Lake Fark, but um, it became too unsafe for him there because of the active partisans and the Allied air raids. And at the end of 1943. So he moved on to a more quiet region in of uh, Vorarlberg. A small village of Rötes near Feldkirch became his hideout. Domscheid produced a series of views of this village, um, its surrounding portraits of its inhabitants. But driven by inner tensions and depression, however, he mainly painted unconspicuous still lives with flowers and mountain landscapes. In cold colors, in order to keep his head above water financially. His art become a currency that he could exchange for food, but also for painting utels and paints. Perhaps as a counter reaction to the German discrimination against his art, he returned completely to his Lithuanian roots. And from this time on, he signed only with his Lithuanian name, Tranas Domscheitis. Now, um, I have a problem. Um, sorry, I have now lost my translation, so I had to come back to my German version. Mm, at the end of the war, to, um, 
Tanas stayed there in the forward back. Like to go back to Berlin, he don't want it to go back to East Prussia and Lithuania. He couldn't. So as a he was accepted as a displaced person and firstly planned, but without success, together with his wife Adelheid to go to the United States. Like uh, several of his colleagues of uh, of of uh, Lithuanian artists was moved there, but um, an invitation to his wife as a teacher of um, of a sing teacher to the University of Cape Town um, forced them to uh, immigrate in 1949 to South Africa. Domscheitis, in the age of 69, um, was able to, was very fast able to go inside of that art scene. And um, he was get a, a, a member of uh, the um, group um, of the cult, the cult new group, where also um, very successful um, Painters like Irma Stern and Margit Lauser are part of. Like in the apartheid regime, he was very privileged as a white artist and he painted um, landscapes, portraits, and still lives and religious themes. But also he um experimented with um some different forms and more abstract forms which we see we'll see later um the um but he was still interested in the um, rural life and uh, the peasant uh, work. And he only chose for that um, the black people of their other motive. Um, that also is a view of the expressionism, which here also follow the uh, Domscheit, Domscheitis. Um, as in the 1910s and 20s, his um, figures are uh, like woodcut, um, but um, now he come back to his colors and black lines are now give a um, good contrast to the colors and they are now... Um, um, And now a sign for this art in this time. He liked the colors of the um, of the people and of um, that um, colors also um, remembered him to the textile art uh, of the Lithuanian um, of his Lithuanian home. In the 1950s, he also uh, painted there a number of portraits of African women. And uh, this show like that he saw them as an individuals and not like an ethnological uh, study objects. So um, he was um, met them with, with respect, uh, which I think also not is used at the time there. very unusual for his uh, life since that since there uh, was that he stayed 
they are only in Cape Town. Let's say first in Berlin, he just moved between 1911 and 1935 five times. But let's say uh, from the view of his, his age, he wasn't so like um, restless than in the years before the war. But nevertheless, he traveled to South Africa for the look for new motives. And um, he liked the, um, the landscapes of the South African deserts, especially the um, Peru desert. Like to the middle of 1950s, his um, paintings of of the landscapes are nearly nearly the same. Um, a high point of view, um, and big areas of paint, some objects in the midground, and sometimes also something in the foreground. But he experimented with some different styles. Um, some of uh, the paintings are getting in the direction of abstract or cubistic styles. Um, colors was getting a uh, contrast to uh, each other. And, um, but he every time painted figures and objects like the, he never was go to abstract art. And this is typical as you see here for his art in that time, very prolonged um, figures, very prolonged proportions and very, very um, simple hairs and um, faces um, without any individuality. Also, the background are not de defined. But as I just said, the biblic motifs are, he, uh, he still worked with it. So you see here also the flight to Egypt and it's not so much far of his work of the 1920s, like he modernized them and, and um, like for example, the the light is more lighter, but uh, is uh, but um, the composition and uh, the made of light are very the same. But here also, as you just can see, an intensive use of white color is uh, now he ve very much used for him. And he also come to new motives and the crucifixion is now in his um, paintings to see. Um, here we see um, very um, strong um, crucifixion, the middle Christ and and Normally he shows three figures and gives them two figures more. And that is, he follow there some um, Lithuanian are um, paintings of, of the crucifixion. So in his last years of his life, he was accepted as an artist in South Africa. So he was sent it to the Biennale of Sao Paulo in Brazil, 1934. But also in uh, Lithuania, uh, he was noticed. In the age of 85, and after a vivid life, Domscheid, Pranas Domscheid, died in 1965 in Cape Town, where, was, where he was also buried. But let's say 
for his art, the story that ended. His wife Adelheid got married again and was go with her new husband to Hawaii where she died in 1992. But she was look after the heir of Domscheid and was organized some exhibitions in South Africa and Germany. And um, she also was given some of the paintings of, of uh, Dom Franz Domscheid to South African art museums. But uh, the most part was given to the Lithuanian culture fund and after the um, independence of the Lithuanian Lys Republic 1990, um, all of this art was go to the Lithuanian National Art Museum and they was opened the Pranastam Shaitis Gallery in Klaipeda. So it's a little wonder that, let's say, all these artworks moved from, let's say, from Berlin to Bavaria, to Austria, to South Africa, to the United States and back to Klaipeda. So over 700 artworks are still there in Klaipeda. So here I end my um, lecture about Franz Domscheid, and I hope I will give you a little overview of the artist and his moved history in Germany, in Lithuania and South Africa. And I thank you for your attention. And yes, so I give my word to uh, Ms. Stern. Thank you very much. Miss Stern, we cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me yes. now? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'm um, very thankful for this deep insight into uh, Franz Domscheid's art and work uh, and life. Um, and um, Domscheid is a, uh, was a good friend of Fritz Ascher's, so I knew a lot already, but I still learned, uh, learned a lot today. So um, we have a few questions here about um, World, uh, World War II, um, how he really was affected. Uh, we learned he moved to Austria um, in 1939, and how else was he impacted? Did he have a family? Um, he met his wife before uh, the move to Austria. So how did they survive? Um, how did they live through? How did they su survive World War II in Austria? So, um... Firstly, he, he 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 was alone. Like uh, he was tried to to let her career like that that was separate. Uh, just also before like um, and when he had got in trouble with uh, with his art, like uh, that was um, let's say stayed not together. And um, in the in the first time when he was go to Austria, he was alone in in. Um, Corinthia and but she was come to him in 1943 to uh, to Retes to Paul Aberg and there they survived the war 
Mm -hmm. And of course, like they didn't have any family. Like it was only that two people and like there was led there had that they had a house in Berlin, but uh, like uh, that was destroyed. And, and uh, so um, she also didn't have a place to come back. So, so she was go to, to his place in, in, in Austria, which also was safer than Berlin in that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so why exactly was he banned by the Nazis in 1938? Um, and can you say more about his feelings about Lithuania and why he did not live there? Mm. That is a good question. I wasn't found anything why he was banned. Like I was only uh, read about that, that he was banned. But um, I think as you saw in the um, his artworks of the 1920s, of his expressionistic uh, period, I think that really wasn't uh, uh, politically correct in that time. So um, that was probably the reason that he was banned, um, but I really couldn't find anything about it, I have to say. Mm -hmm. That and if Lithuania, it's, it's uh, a good question. And um, um, like I was just uh, speak about my colleagues in Lithuania, like, and they said, it's really not known that he was so much there. Like he, that was also like Lithuania was a feeling more, more like the connection to his mother than really to he he wasn't lived there. He was several times there of course we have some some paintings of lithuania but very 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 rarely and of course he has to be there in 1920 when he got the new passport that we know but really to say that's all what we know when he was in lithuania so more we really don't know and uh, he wasn't also right uh, like he was right in 40 in 1947 about his life, a, bio a biography, but um, also that he not mentioned there. So we really don't know like uh, that uh, his relation to Lithuania was go more far than of his heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I do think uh, probably he was... Um... He was not allowed to work and exhibit uh, his art, um, create, exhibit his art and sell his art uh, in Nazi Germany because he was affiliated with expressionists um, because this, you know, of the colors, because of the, uh, yeah, the, the formal decisions he made in his work. I think many considered his work as expressionistic, mm -hmm. which um which um made him an enemy of uh nazi art politics um i i guess so um <clears throat> so why uh so that's would that also be the reason why he decided to take on the lithuanian passport in um and not the german one or wasn't that an option because he came from Prussia, right? It was considered Prussia. So he, yes. would he have had a German passport? And I think he so also had a German passport. I think he has to be. He has to be ha like I also that that I couldn't really see. Like, but I think he was he had a German and a Lithuanian passport. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that was possible in that times, but I think so. He had that too. Nationalities and. Um, I think um, that also, like that German passport, helped in in that time. Like also, he he had to to prove his origins uh, in the Nazi time. Mm -hmm. So um, I think he had that uh, that passport. And mm -hmm. He has German passport. Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, so. Carla is asking no political references in his work. I mean, it's interesting uh, mm. 
right? Or are there any works that you decided not to show where he has political references? No, like he was in that, he was trying to like, also like in his childhood, he he don't want to go in somebody's way. And there was, there's any political uh, subjects in his, in his paintings, like uh, as you just see, also in his South African art, like uh, there's also not any political subject to see. Like, of course, he uh, worked with the black people there also with respect, but um, that's, I think you cannot say it's a, it's a political subject. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And Iris is saying it's interesting how much he traveled. I mean, looking at his uh, strong roots in Lithuania, uh, uh, he uh, was out of there most of the time, right? And mm -hmm. he, he carried that uh, uh, always with, with him wherever he, uh, wherever he was and lived. So that's a very interesting thing that I also um, want to point out um, um, that um, I think Franz Domscheid's art and life are a really stark reminder of how strongly we carry our roots and the experiences of our mm -hmm. early childhood through life. Um, the wide landscape of, of East Prussia, rural, uh, rural village life, earthly colors, uh, and the religiosity of his Lithuanian roots um, really carried Domscheid's art until his death in South Africa. I I find that really incredible. Um, it's true, like 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 that like that topics he had really in his mind and his heart, like and you can say from the beginning to his end, like rural life, be like the biological topics and. That was just Franz Domscheid's art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jan Rüttinger. This uh, was um, really a really interesting and enlightening talk. Um, I get that feedback also from uh, from all the participants that uh, noted sent notes here in the in the chat and Q and A. Uh, Thank you so much, um, everybody, for listening. Take good care and stay well. I have also. Thank you very much.